Okay, welcome everybody. Today we are talking about organic pest management with Amanda Brezel from Fennegan's Farms. We are very excited to have her and I'm gonna let her take it away from where she's at. Alrighty, hello folks. Um, here we go. So we're, today we're mostly just talking about how to keep that balance in the ecosystem around your growing space. So for this, um, we've moved in. So with organic pest management, the idea behind the approach is that you're focusing on preventative me measures and a more holistic way to do that versus a remedial approach. So the goal is not to get your garden to a space and then come after the fact to remove the pests and things like that. Um, it's more so about creating optimal growing conditions. So the emphasis really is on the biodiversity that's in the area, as well as different cultural practices that you can do to keep your ecosystem in a more uh, a balanced state. So here are a few here are a few examples. Let me grab my laptop cord because I don't, I don't want my computer to die. Okay, so what folks are probably used to is the conventional approach, which is mostly to just spray an, spray an insecticide to control things in the garden. So in this case, that might be caterpillars or something like that. But what ends up happening is that when you, when you kill one pest, you leave your space open for, basically in killing those pests, you then can also harm the actual other insects that are in the space that would actually be beneficial. So in this example, you spray insecticide to control caterpillars, which, which often results in a secondary outbreak of aphids or spider mites because beneficial insects, such as the lady beetles and other predators are also killed. So in an organic approach, um, you're, you enhance the habitat for beneficial insects to increase the population, reduce stress on the crop and the plant itself, and use adapted varieties, and you use non-chemical methods to control the pests. So that could be just picking out plants that are not doing so well, uh, setting out traps for the plants, or even doing things like crop rotation, which we'll get into all of this throughout the class. So here are some cultural controls, examples of cultural controls. Resistant cultivars, um, I just went ahead and put a little definition in here. Plants that are um, naturally a little more resistant to disease and pests. Crop rotation, companion planting, timing of your planting, sanitation. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Rachel, thanks a lot, I appreciate your time. Thank you. We might, um, okay. Sanitation, soil management, mulches, composting, tillage, flaming, and trap crop crops. So we'll also dig into that a little more as we go. So each of these will go over. So when we're talking about resistant cultivars, some varieties may be less attractive to pest species or tolerate more damage than others. So the things that might contribute to that would be the plant size, shape, the color of the plant, whether or not the plant has hair or maybe the cuticle thickness as well, and natural chemicals or repellents and things that can affect how, the, how susceptible that plant might be to disease or to a pest. So here are a couple of more examples. So there's when you were looking at morpholo morphological characteristics, those mostly just include plant structures that interfere with insect movement, feeding, or reproduction associated with the plant. And something that, you know, examples of that would be the color of the plant, the thickness of the cell walls on the leaves of the plant, the tissue, the surface of the plant, whether or not it has like a waxy coating that might keep plants away from them, spines, things like that. And then when we're looking at physiological defenses, they include plant produced compounds that deter certain pests. So we'll talk a little bit, a bit more about pyrethium. It's derived from the blooms of African chrysanthemum, 
Um, we will get into that a little bit more as we're talking about what you can put on your plants to keep them put around or on your plants to keep them safe. Um, some plants have specific color related resistance. And one thing to keep in mind here is that most insects are attracted to leaves in the yellowish to green range color. So when you have healthy dark green leaves, um, they're less attractive to some uh, less attractive than yellowing plants under stress. So that's one of the things that we're mentioning is the, the really big goal is to keep your garden very healthy because when you see that sickness and things like that coming into the garden, those are things that can attract more pests and um, critters and things like that. So let's get into a little bit more about crop rotation. So insects overwinter in soil and debris, they reinfest new and can reinfest a new crop if they're susceptible and build up um, populations. So one thing like the example that we have is that let's say you plant tomatoes in one space one year and there's a specific pest that is going specifically to your tomatoes. They're eating up all of your tomatoes and you're just like, oh my goodness. You get through the season, you're finally able to be done and you don't have to worry about whatever's eating up your tomatoes. But then very next year you go back to that space and you say, okay, I wanna put tomatoes here again. Well, you have to think the, the insects and things that were attacking those tomato plants are likely not gone. They might, they, there's a really good chance that they've just made a habitat in the soil around where you were planting in the previous year. So something that might help in that, in that regard is to just take that, instead of putting your tomato plants back into the area where they'd be most susceptible to the insects that are in the soil, you might move them down a couple beds or put them in a different part of the garden so that a different area of the garden can help to support the health of that plant. So three questions to consider when deciding whether crop rotation will actually help you manage your pest. How long can the pest persist in the field without any host? And so how long is that those pests, how long are they really going to be in the soil for? How um, compatible is it, uh, how, I'm sorry, how capable is it of invading from other areas? So are you planting your, if you're gonna move your crops, are you planting them far enough away from the space that they were in in the year? prior to that? And how well does it survive on other hosts when the crop is not present? So then you're really getting into thinking about, okay, if I'm going to plant carrots here now instead, or maybe I've decided to plant cabbage here instead, then will it actually, will these pests then decide to be on my new crops? So you have to kind of think like, what would you take it, take out? What would you replace it with? And would those things still be, um, getting under the same stress. So plant a non-susceptible crop uh, so that pests have no food, essentially. Um, know your botanical families so that you can leave as much time as possible between related crops. So I believe here is a really good example of that crop rotation. So, you know, year one, here are your crops here up at the top, but then year two, now we're replacing where we would have normally put our tomatoes, we're gonna to put spinach there. We're gonna replace the peas with the corn and things like that, because these are all in different, for the most part, they're all in different families. And so you're not going to get the same pest on the same plant um, since you moved it. So that's the idea behind that. Another thing that you can do is companion planting. So you can um, attractant crops and repellent crops. So small flower, uh, carrot family, daisy family, mints, catnips, caraway, dill, fennel, um, and some of these herbs here. Those are great. These are really, really great crops. Um, I personally, we grow a lot of medicinal herbs. And so we're always going to have beds and beds of herbs. Um, that's always going to be available. Um, and so it doesn't mean that you should not grow these things, um, but they can be used to pull the pest off of your other plants. And so we'll get into a little bit more about trap crops. Um, what we do around some of our plants is we'll have like trap versions or like repellent versions of what we're growing, stuff that we're, we know we're not going to eat, stuff that we know that we're not going to sell. We might plant those in between. There's still herbs, herbs that we would normally grow to sell, but we're specifically not going to be using those because they're there specifically to attract pests away from some of our crops 
or repel them based off of some of the compounds that they have inside. Another thing to keep in mind is the timing of the plant planting. So keep notes. This is a really, really um, good tip. I want to thank Molly from Keep Growing Detroit for putting these slides together because um, this is a really good tip here. So keep notes to record the pest and disease outbreak patterns. The first date that you see a problem and the coinciding um, phenological events. So if you walk into the garden and you're seeing um, a hookworm and it's on your plants and it's eating things, you're gonna write that down. You're gonna say, okay, Monday, or I'm sorry, Tuesday, May 24th, I came outside and this was happening on my garden. So that you can keep, so that you can keep track of when specific pests might be in the garden and keep track of even how long the, the issue might persist. So adjusting your planting schedule according, accordingly will help because then you can help avoid some of that peak pressure. So that really does depend on the pest itself and what season they will reach their peak at. Um, you know, aphids might pop up at a different time than your uh, flea beetle. So experiment with different planting dates. One of the uh, examples here is to avoid corn earworm or flea beetle or squash, right? So you'll plant at a different time. I'm sorry, a squash bug. Um, so you'll plant at a different time so that, you know, last year or this season, you might see something. But next season, maybe if we start a few weeks later or a few weeks earlier, then we can avoid when this, this major pest will be here to eat this crop. So plant crops susceptible to nematodes, here's an example, early or late while the, while the soil temperatures are cooler. We're gonna talk a little bit more about nematodes themselves, but these are like, they're like little round worms. Um, I personally think they're kind of gross to look at, um, but they live in the soil. So if you were to plant them while it's cooler or later, I'm sorry, well, if you were to plant them earlier or later while it's cooler, then you can avoid having them on your plants. One other thing you wanna keep in mind is sanitation. So select healthy plants. Uh, you can rogue and prune your plants. If you're not familiar with roguing, that just means removing. So instead of going and just pulling different leaves and things, you could go and pull out the plants that look like they're getting sick instead. Um, I wouldn't recommend just like killing your entire crop, but if you do go and see some, oh, this tomato plant is really, really getting hurt, or this one is really, really sickly and is going to cause another pest to come in to eat the plant while it is sick, then that might be a really good idea to go ahead and remove that plant while it's, while it's sick. So remove crop debris um, promptly to reduce the overwintering for and sites for pests. So if you're going to do your pruning, don't um, try to try your best. If you're not, if you're going to prune your plants and then you want to use that plant matter for, you know, in an, a more organic way, then that's perfectly fine. But I would not recommend just like pruning off all of the leaves and leaving them on the ground there because then you can invite other pests in to come. Maybe taking those and throwing them in the compost bin if they're not sick, things like that might work a little better. So um, you also want to eliminate all, um, eliminate alternate host, but be careful about the timing once again. Uh, you may remove something at one point in the season, but it could leave your plant susceptible to something that is at its peak. So pay attention to pulling out different plants at different times. Soil management is very important. So healthy soils, high in organic matter, and with a biologically diverse food web, support plant health and nutrition better than soils with low, that are low in organic matter and species diversity. So healthy plants are generally less susceptible to pest damage. Approximately 75% of insect pests spend part of their life cycle in the soil. And so healthy soils contain many natural enemies and insect pests, including insect predators, pathogenic fungi, and insect parasitic uh, nematodes. All right, and here is a really nice diagram that kind of talks a little bit more about the food web. Um, Keto, are these slides going to be shared? Yes. Okay, yeah, so you guys can take a look at this once we go through. I remember when I was like finishing my uh, bio biology degree, there was a class that I took that I had to memorize a chart that looked very similar to this. 
unfortunately, I don't really know <laughs> that much that much anymore. It has half of it has escaped my brain. I got my my A in my class and kept going. So you got, we can go over this a little bit more at the end if you want to go back to it, or you guys can go over it a little bit more um, on your own if you don't have any questions. So we go. Uh, uh, while we take a, a quick pause, uh, how, yeah. how is everybody doing? Any questions thus far? We've, there's a lot of information being covered here, so I just wanted to check in. Carla says good. Marguerite, yep, doing great. Okay, we're going to keep rolling unless there's any questions. Drop your questions in the chat if you got any. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll just we'll just keep rolling along and or as, as we go, just feel free to add, as uh, drop questions and then I'll, I can find a. A nice point uh, to interject and, and ask Amanda for you. Okay, doing great. Somebody did just pop in. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay, let's keep going. So here we go. So soil management, a little bit more about that. Um, a soil's physical condition, uh, meaning its level of compaction, water holding capability, and drainage, those are things that all affect soil and plant health. The chemical aspects of soil, like your pH, the salt content, the availability of the nutrients, those can help affect crop health and plant susceptibility and pest susceptibility as well. So good soil helps to get uh, helps to make healthy plants. So if you are trying to improve your soil health, there's a couple of things you can do. You can increase the, the soil organic matter. If I'm not mistaken, these are red clovers here. Hmm. Um, we per I really, really like crimson clover. Um, one, it's edible. So if you don't, uh, if you harvest it, you can eat it. I think they taste pretty good. And another thing that you can do is that if you use this as a cover crop, then you can actually just use this as organic matter when you're ready. So, and they also offer a lot of beneficial things to the soil. So keep your soils covered with a cover crop and or crop residue to reduce erosion and protect from extremes of moisture and temperature. So closer to the end of the season, you might go ahead and plant a cover crop so that, you know, over the winter, you have something that will cover your soil. If that's not what you're, you plan to do, then you can also cover your crops or cover the soil where you would normally plant your crops with something else, maybe like a tarp or something like that. Shrubs, um, and then, shrub, right? Mm -hmm. Some shredded leaves. Yep. 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 Or shredded leaves. So plan tillage operations very carefully. Um, what you don't want to end up doing is tilling your property and then removing all of the good stuff that you needed in your soil. So let's talk a little bit more about mulches. Um, plastic mulches that speed early season, um, early season crop growth can enhance the plant's ability to withstand insect feeding. Um, it'll be a, a, an older plant faster if you think about it like that. Um, reflect, reflective mulches can reduce uh, tri tripes, I'm sorry, I don't know that word, and aphid Rips. population, thank yeah. you, um, and aphid populations and crops. So straw mulch can also reduce problems with Colorado potato beetle. Up here in the right-hand corner, there's an example of straw mulches right there. And then let's see, and I believe this next photo, here's an example of having, um, putting down a more of a plastic or resistant here. So you don't you know, it's a little bit easier, a little bit easier to grow in at the beginning of a season. Let's talk a little more about tillage. So it can disrupt the life cycle of pests and uh, other beneficials. It can expose pests to predators and the other elements. If you till before planting um, to control weeds, that harbor army worms, cutworms, plant worms, and aphids, that can be beneficial as well. And tilling in the fall to destroy overwintering sites for flea beetles, corn borers, squash, and bugs. So that's a little bit more of what we mean when we're talking about planning your tillage, putting it in a, doing it at a time that makes the most sense for the ecosystem that you're managing. So it might not, you know, it depends on what works best for you. You might do both. You might not do either, but you might do one. But it really depends on what it, what is your main 
problem there. So balance with the need to maintain ground cover. Once the space is tilled, you could potentially plant in the space, but adding a ground cover to the planting zone that will help deter pests and add the health to the soil, that can be pretty beneficial as well. So sometimes what we'll do in a space where we've made a new bed, we'll go ahead and plant something there and then we'll cover it up, cover up the soil itself with another plant that will spread across the bed itself. So like I mentioned, we grow a lot of medicinal herbs. One thing that we use that can help to deter, deter pests away from places or even attract them away from our other plants is when we grow mint. I know that uh, mint gets a pretty bad rep because it can be pretty invasive, um, but we we can use it as a ground cover for some of our crops and it works really well to keep some things out. Uh, there's a few questions here. Okay, cool. Um, what are, back to the, I think the previous slide or a couple slides ago, uh, what are reflective mulches? Mm -hmm. And then um, how long plastic mulch stays on until when? So the plastic mulch itself, um, when you're looking at, well, okay, so we'll talk about reflective mulch. Um, your reflective mulches can be things that are like, kind of like tarps. Here, let me show you this guy. This guy can work as a, it's kind of like this material and it will, it like brightens up the area. Sometimes if you pass farms that use reflective mulch, um, it looks like there's a bunch of glass on the ground, um, especially when it's a sunny day. It just looks like sheets of water or sheets of glass. Um, and it's just like a, a bright reflective material. Um, when we're looking at the other question was about pl uh, plastic mulch, right? Yeah. How long to keep it on? Oh, um, that really just depends on what when you're what your growing season is. So I guess in my example, I, I use something like this before. So like last season, I was helping out a different farm and they focused on growing what were they growing? Kale and collard greens. And they set them up in, a, in an area just like this. We laid that down about, I would say maybe three weeks before we started planting. And then we pulled it up when it came time for us to remove all of the plants at the end of the season. I personally wouldn't, um, I personally would just say that it really just depends on what you're growing and the length of your growing season. Um, how about you, Keto? Yeah, I mean, I think like this is this picture is from the KGD farm, and um, there are certain circumstances that people use it and they they keep it down. It's it's pretty it's like semi permanent. Um, the holes that are burned in these are a, a specific spacing. So if you're trying to line that up with, and this happens to be strawberries, which is a perennial crop, but um, but like if you're, if you're, you know, Amanda was talking about rotation earlier and, you know, different plant crop types have different spacing. So you may need to move them around, but the whole idea, you know, part of the idea here is also for weed management is just to like suppress weed germination. We have really terrible weeds at the KGD farm. Um, so that's like, this is one of the things that we've been working on just because of the weed bank is just intense. Um, so somewhat subjective, like Amanda was saying. Yep. So, let's see, where were we? Um, were there any other questions? Uh, there's not, not directly about this. I'm gonna follow up somebody in the, ch in the chat. Okay, cool. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about trap crops. Trap crops, we kind of will, I personally kind of use them and I mean that more in just like, sometimes I might just go ahead and plant the thing that I know is attracting a lot of pests. Like I might just go ahead and plant it next to something else so that it can it can take the pest, the pressure away from that other plant. So a trap crop is a crop that is planted to lure insect pests away from the cash crop itself. Successful use of trap crops can be challenging um, the trap crop must be given must be more attractive to the pest than the actual cash crop, and care must be given that the pests in the trap crop don't then later migrate over to your cash crop. 
So um, trap crops are not uh, effective against pests that are weak flyers like aphids um, or are wind dispersed like spider mites. Um, so you are really kind of be, you would need to, to use it to focus on insects and things that migrate differently um, because you do run the risk of planting something next to your crops and then having all the pests get on it and then get back over to your crops. Um, in organic systems with fewer insecticidal options, pests are often killed through crop destruction, but the timing of crop destruction, destruction is critical. And as we mentioned before, that's critical because you don't wanna end up destroying something that was actually keeping some of your some of your pests away. You don't want to end up destroying something at the peak of something else's season. So now you've removed it and now your cash crops are, they're weak. They're poor little sitting ducks. Um, research on trap crops has revealed mixed results for its use as a pest management strategy. Sorghum and sunflowers, those are two trap crops that I've used in the past. Honestly, I've not had a ton of success with trap crops and it's mostly because you will get that kind of like backflow of your pests going back to the area. And I think that I personally was just either removing my trap crops too early or just not keeping them far enough away from my other plants. Um, but these two are pretty inexpensive, especially if you're just trying to, you know, keep some of the bigger critters out of your your garden. I would say trap crops work a little better if you're trying to keep like squirrels or gophers and things like that out of the garden rather than insects. Um, so like I know my strawberries keep getting one bite taken out of them each. So I'm thinking about planting <laughs> some things around my strawberries so that uh, they can survive the season. Um, here we go. Here's an example of a trap crop in organic broccoli. Let's see right over here. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but in this top middle one here, you can notice that there's another plant planted in here. I believe that's kale. Um, and that's a space where you'll pull the different beetles to it that are not hurting your actual broccoli. So here we go. So some of the physical, we'll talk about physical controls. Um, we'll talk about manual controls, physical barriers, baits, traps, and lures. Oh. And then our manual controls would be hand picking, mowing, uh, pruning, shaking, or water sprays. Water sprays can be really effective um, in the garden as well. Sometimes you don't even need to put anything on your plants. If you're coming out there every day, you can go out there and shake your plants or spray them down, um, spray them with the hose pretty well, and it can take the pests off of your, off of your plants. Um, and kill them so that they don't come back. So some physical barriers include bagging fruit, crawling pest barriers, cutworm collars, floating row covers, mulches and trenches. And we do have a couple of pictures here. Um, here we go, he's cute. <laughs> and here we go. So biological controls, beneficial animals and insects, Beneficial microorganisms, um, milky spore, um, fung uh, a fungus, and um, a protozoan as well. Uh, I am, uh, <laughs> surprisingly for somebody who spends a lot of time outside, there are certain creepy crawlies that are just creepy to me. So I'm going to keep going. Um, biological control in action. So augmentation, it increases the population through purchase and release. So what you can do is... A really good example is sometimes if you are looking to deter a pest from your garden, you can introduce ladybugs. And so there's lots of places online where you can get little baby ladybugs and release them into your garden to help control what's going on. Um, conservation, the increase existing populations through habitat conservation and other means. So, you know, you might already see that there's there's something, a predator that's gonna come and take care of the pests for you. So maybe making the space more inviting for those predators that are not necessarily eating your plants, but will be there to eat the, uh, eat the pests, um, that can be really beneficial well. And it's a very, um, it's an easier way to do things without needing to use chemicals. 
Um, but it all really just comes down to um, maintaining a balance in your ecosystem. So soil um, and having a respect for the other critters that were already in the plate, already in the space that um, know how to take care of those other pests. So now we're gonna get more into organic pesticides um, and we'll talk about rescue treatment. So before we jump into this, did anyone have any other questions? Um, so there was a question about possums, but I said we would get to specific pests later. Um, so uh, the situation with raised beds and um, they have, con they have containers and such outside of the raised beds and maybe that she was thinking, talking about maybe I could use those containers along the raised beds for trap crops. Yeah, I mean, you could. Yeah, there's, I don't think that there's any harm in trying. Yeah, I mean, just play with it. But like, like Amanda was saying though, like there's mixed reviews on how well the trap crop idea works. So, but you know, it's a big experiment and it, you know, all gardening is, uh, is about trial and error. So it's worth trying for, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And then you'll see what works. Cause again, this is one of those things where it's like, okay, you're managing your ecosystem. Ooh, did I go too far? Okay. You're managing your ecosystem. And so your ecosystem in your backyard or at the community garden down the street is going to be very different from what's going on, you know, at your neighbor's house and your neighbor's garden, or maybe your friend who has a garden on the other side of the city. So each thing is gonna be very much so tailored to what is going on in your specific space. So pesticides and organic production. <clears throat> when cultural, mechanical, and biological strategies are insufficient to prevent or control crop pests, weeds, or diseases, a biological or botanical substance or a substance included on the national list um, of synthetic substances allowed for use in organic crop production may be applied to prevent, suppress, or control pests, weeds, or diseases. So make sure you document your, their use in your garden, especially if you are working, if your garden is for um, profit, if you have a garden that's for profit and you have the certifications and everything to, and the approval and everything to have your garden as a certified organic space, then you have to make sure that you are documenting the use of these organic compounds in your garden space. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, all of those. So botanical pesticides, they are plant derived materials such as neem, pyre um, pyrethium. This is the one that I mentioned before that is in, found in chrysanthemum flowers and uh, uh, rotten on. Characteristics of biological insecticides, uh, they break down rapidly in the environment. Some are more toxic than um, synthetic pesticides. So you have to be very careful. Um, they can be used in a broad spectrum way, but they must be used carefully. Um, only neem and pyrethium are approved for organic production. So be very um, careful about what you would want to use. Um, because what you don't want to do is accidentally violate um, your organic space with something uh, that you technically are not really like approved to be using. And one thing that I want to say, the one of the reasons why some of these botanical insecticides are more toxic than, than synthetic pesticides is because it's derived, they're derived from plants that have natural defense mechanisms already. And so you're pulling out the you know, very concentrated form of something that comes naturally in a plant so that it can deter those things. So, you know, maybe planting those chrysanthemum flowers around in the space, you know, instead of necessarily using some of the, uh, the synthetic version, you could just plant the chrysanthemums in the area. So you can get a little bit creative and see what really works. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about each one. Um, uh, pyrethrum, they're extracted from the flower of the uh, flower of the in the chrysanthemum family. Uh, contact poison with quick knockdown effects controls aphids, beetles, caterpillars, thrips, and mealybugs. So um, it is an OMRI approved product, um, including 
Pygenic. So Organic Materials Review Institute, that's what the OMRI stands for. If you are looking, went back too far. If you're looking to find a compound that you can use in your garden, then you can look up some of the different compounds with their name and then just go ahead and tag that OMRI to the back of your search and it will tell you whether or not that is something that has been approved or even specific brands of different products that you can use in the space. Neem oil. So extracted from the fruit of a tree grown from India to Africa. It works as a hormone mimic um, repellent, stomach poison, and some fungicidal properties have been reported. It controls a wide variety of insects, and it is also, um, oh, there are a few different uh, OMRI approved formulations here. Now, um, if you, so neem oil is actually one of the main things that I use in my space. It works really well. I do not like the smell. Um, I, I personally just really don't like the smell. Most most critters and creatures and people are, you're not gonna like the smell anyway. And so in the way that it, it, it you smell it and it is kind of giving you that stomach wretch, that's, that's the goal. Um, that's what you want it to be doing. Now, there is a Detroit born company. There's a, a family, they're from, the, from Detroit themselves and they're currently living in Hawaii. You can find them on Instagram at, um, Aina underscore company. Um, and they actually have an, a neem oil that works really, really well. Um, and it's really, it's relatively inexpensive. So I would recommend them. That's my personal recommendation. I always like to support my Detroit born folks. All right, let's talk a little bit more about this parasitic fungi. So the spores of the fungus germinate once they come into contact with the insect pest then the fungus must penetrate the cuticle and affect the body cavity to kill the pest. So that's effective on many insects, including aphids, thrips, white flies, and grasshoppers. They work best when applied at the, oop, back, at the onset of the infestation, takes a week or more after application to actually see the evidence of the control. Um, and down below here, we have more approved formulations like my control and naturalist L. So I'm gonna use this as well. And that's very interesting. It's, it's kind of cool to, to see how it works. Um, parasitic nematodes, they um, semi-aquatic, uh, they live and move in the soil. They're sensitive to UV radiation and desiccation. Uh, let's see, that when you're looking to, um, I would say, kill off, um, you would spray or your application of it would be spraying or doing it through irrigation. You could um, drip it over the uh, over the, the crops or in the, the soil area. Um, fertig fertigation, um, aerial watering can, application should be followed by irrigation. Don't apply during the hottest part of the day, but soil should be greater than 60 degrees. So that's it. Okay, spinal sad. Derived from a soil dwelling bacterium, controls beetle larvae, caterpillars, thrips. Um, and this is, this is important because we're gonna talk a little bit more about the life cycle of some of these insects and things. And a lot of the time, if you can get to your insect um, or some of your other pests as you know, in there while they're still in egg form, or while they're very young, then it can help to deter those things. So finding something that can help you with that early on is very helpful. Um, it's most effective when ingested rather than as a contact insecticide, in, insecticide. It's pretty fast acting, better than, here we go. It's better than our, um, where'd it go? It works a little bit better on our the caterpillars. I'm trying to, um, it's escaping me now, the uh, BT. Supposedly not as soft on beneficials, so use in targeted areas. Um, and Intrust is a formulation that is approved for organic production on many vet vegetables as well. Um, just a quick reminder, we're gonna be sharing these slides as well. So if you have, if you're not sure or can't remember the name of some of these as well, then um, they will be included afterward as well. So inorganic pesticides, um, Diomatius earth, um, 
uh, kaolin, insecticidal soap, and horticultural oil. Uh, here we go. The com okay, so this compound, di di diatomaceous earth, um, the compound is made from the ground up bodies of prehistoric diamatic fossils. When ground, these tiny oceanic skeletal pieces are very sharp and produce the effect of many miniature razor blades on the respiratory systems of any smaller insect or bug that inhales it. Um, that sounds very painful. Um, it also causes dying of the mucous membranes of breathing holes and lungs and in bugs. Um, it must be reapplied after every rain or heavy dew in order to be effective or to remain effective. It's important to note that food grade um, is not the only kind appropriate for use I'm sorry, is the only kind appropriate for use in gardens and around pets and kids. Quick question mm -hmm. um, for uh, talking about neem. There's a question, yeah. do, you, do you mix your neem with dish soap or, or dilute or just dilute it with water and spray it? Personally, I just dilute it with water and spray it. Um, and that's it, I don't, I, don't, I don't add any dish soap. I think dish soap can be effective and sometimes folks might use it to help with the smell of it all. Um, I just dilute it because I feel like I personally can't even use it without diluting it. I don't like the, how it, I just don't, I don't really like how it smells. So I, I'll make sure to dilute it and it'll help it go a little further. Um, so I'm sorry, were there any other questions about the neem oil? No, that's it. Okay, perfect. Um, let's get back to this one. So this is effective against slugs, beetles, worms, fleas, mites, and most any spider or insect. It is not much of a concern for larger creatures though. Anyone who is particularly sensitive to particulates, like those with asthma or any other type of breathing condition, will want to avoid directly breathing in the dust. This is a really good use to just put your mask on when you're out there for a little bit. You can sprinkle it directly on the ground where slugs are most likely to reproduce, or you can apply a light dusting to the plants themselves. So here is an example of them. They're very, very tiny, um, as you can imagine, because they would have to be small enough for an insect to inhale it. It just looks like right. looks like powder when yeah. you when you put it like when you, you when you see it, it just it just looks like talcum powder or something. Basically, yeah. There you go. All right, so we're gonna get into a little bit of insect biology. We're going to kind of move through this a little fast, um, just because um, you'll you'll understand as we're going through it. <laughs> we go. So, insect classification. One of the reasons why it's important to understand, you know, the kingdom, the phylum, the class, order, family, genus, species, and understand that whole tree that goes all the way down um, is because it will help you to identify the different families that a lot of these insects fall into. So, if you're using something that is to deter one insect, it's very helpful to know what, what else belongs to this family so that that same thing that you're using could be used um, to control other part, other creatures and critters and things that are in your garden. Some insect orders. Um, so these, I'm not going to go um, super in depth into the, the different names for all of these, um, but these are some of the, the, I guess you could say, like their families. You know, you got your aphids, your scales, your white flies. Um, and then over here, let's talk about like our damselfly and our dragonflies, right? They're all gonna be in the same kind of little family. So what you're using for, for one could be very effective in using some of the other ones. But like, let's look at this one over here. So this family here includes our butterflies and our moths. Your moths are things that you would definitely want to be pulling away from your garden, especially if you have something like cabbage. But your butterflies that would be there to help pollinate a lot of these things, you don't necessarily want to kill. So when you're looking into control methods for these things, it's important to kind of know who goes with who, because there are some beneficial um, insects that you would actually want to keep around. All right, here's a really good picture of the structure of a typical insect. 
you know, you've got our head, the thorax, abdomen, the very um, bottom, the um, and then, you know, our wings, legs, mouth parts, all of that. All right, some of the features that you're gonna get with your insects will be the wings, the mouth parts. Um, a lot of insects have a different kinds of, um, different mouth parts. So like our butterflies and things, that's got a, it's got a little siphon, or maybe you're dealing with something that is piercing, or maybe something that's got pinchers, and so it it pokes. And it's important to kind of know how that how they work because then it can help you to identify what is eating your plants. So if you go outside and there's little bitty holes taken out of your your food, then you uh, then you know that whatever is eating your plants has little pinchers, or maybe it has um, something in it that is allowing it to chew the the garden. So then that can help you to nar narrow down, oh, well then this probably isn't, um, these probably aren't, no, I'm trying to think. Now every, now every insect I'm thinking of actually chews plants. So <laughs> um, you might look at something and say, okay, you know, that's probably not this because those pests don't chew up my plants. They don't have even have a mouth to do that. Um, you're looking at the legs. Um, that's important to know those these kinds of different parts of that because, as we mentioned before, the way that our insects in the garden migrate is important because then that also plays into how you will deter that pest, right? So if we're thinking about trap crops, one of the issues that you have with trap crops is that if you're dealing with an insect um, that is prone to flying, very you know, is a very very strong flyer then it is very easy for those pests to hop on your trap crop, but then as soon as they're done with your trap crop, then go hop on your actual cash crop. So knowing how they move from place to place is, is important. All right, so I talked a little bit, I touched on a little bit about this before um, when we were discussing just at what stage could you then go and, like at what stage is it most effective to go in and try to kill these pests. Um, so it, when you know this, it can help determine when to apply the products. So if you're looking at an insect that does complete metamorphosis, it has four distinct stages. You're gonna have the egg, the larva, the pupa, and the adult. And for a lot of the things that you're dealing with, like your beetles, butterflies, um, or I would say moths in this case, wasps, lacewings, um, fleas, you would want to get to them when they're in that young stage. You don't want to have to be wait until they've gotten much older and have used your plants to help them complete their life cycle. What you would want to be able to do is to get in there if you see eggs, go in and crush the eggs. Maybe if you see larva putting down something so that the larva is then going to uh, be hurt. Another thing you can do too is like during the time uh, when the larva is most susceptible, like let's say, you know, a lot of insects will go and come back to feed their, their larva. So if you're giving the adult version of this pest something, then you could give it to them so that they could go put it in their garden. I'm sorry, in their, I guess you could say their nest or back with their, their young. Um, incomplete metaphor, metamorphosis is just three stages. So it'll be an egg, a nymph, and then an adult rel relatively quickly. Some examples of that would be your aphids, grasshoppers, termites, things like that. There's a question here. Doesn't it, so th this, this understanding of insect development, doesn't it also help me determine how it will ingest the deterrent and what deterrent to use? Yes. Yep. So that's type. Oh, she's talking about the mouth type, she was saying. Okay. Oh, the mouth type. So to an extent, right? So like you, if you are dealing with something that has like a siphon on a mouth and rather than just like a chewing, then you might want to put something out that they could drink rather than just like a powder for them to come across. So that's like an example. Was that helpful? Yeah. She said, she yep. said yes. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so we're going to get into some common insect pests. Um, in a second here, uh, my dog is asking for things, so I'm about to put him in my lap. Um, here we go. So let's talk about aphids. 
um, the biology of them all. They overwinter as small black eggs on stems and leaves of mature brassica plants. So your brassicas are just gonna be your things in your cabbage family. Many generations, and they do produce many generations in a growing season. Um, one of our garden folks, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Griffin Gardens, um, she was dealing with some aphids earlier in the season and she was able to go ahead and apply some neem oil right before they really got going and it helped to stop all of the other generations of aphids that would have been going throughout the season. She actually had them on her loofah plants and she applied the neem oil and it worked and now her her loofahs are ready and they're beautiful, like, um, you know, not the plant itself, but the, the little seedlings. They're doing really, really well now um, because she was able to catch it very early. Um, here's an example of aphids. Not going to stay on this slide for super long. I just I do want you guys to get an idea of what they look like um, from far away. They can just look like your plant has some spots on it. Um, but if you get up close, then they are these little guys and they can be kind of um, kind of gross to look at. Yeah. Alice, that makes me itch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just kind of uh, make, it makes my face like hot. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit more about management. So one thing you can do is encourage the other beneficial insects. They can go to help make the plant healthier and they can look into, not look into, and they can be there to be a natural predator to some of these, um, to the aphids as well. You wanna check your plants regularly. You always wanna look at the undersides of the leaves and growing near the in the the very usually the tips of the plant. Um, so when you find them, you immediately want to crush them with hand. If yeah, this is a really good time to to do a, a small plug to make sure you are wearing some gloves in the garden. Um, I don't want to smash aphids with my bare hands. If you want to do that with your bare hand, I will leave you to it. Um, but yeah, go ahead and crush them. You can spray them with soapy water or blast off, blast them off with the hose. Um, but you're going to need to continuously do that. It won't be something that you would be would be able to do one time and then come back to it and not have to deal with anymore. So it is something that you would have to be paying attention to. Um, remove the badly infested leaves on larger plants, or remove the badly infested plants if not if not all that are affected. Um, you don't want to do that, right? Like when we put a lot of time and energy into our garden space, you really don't want to have to just remove all of the plants. So the very best thing that you can do is try to jump in there with, in it, with um, your intervention immediately. Spring and fall plantings um, for vigorous plant growth and increased resistance, that's helpful. Um, and then removing old crops and cleaning up crop residues during the season. And at the end of the season, rip out all, your, all of your plants and clean up any leaves, stems, stumps, and bury them in active compost. So again, you don't wanna be coming into your new space to grow something. And there's all of this other organic plant matter sitting all over the place. It's nice because it can help to improve your soil, um, but you would be better to put that in your compost bin so that it can help to improve your soil over time as you spread it. Um, because what you don't wanna do is have those, the plants and the organic matter sitting there just for those same pests to come and then be around your plants, feasting on everything that's on the ground. So keeping a clean uh, space will help that a lot. Flea beetles, so um, in their biology, they overwinter as adults under leaves and debris. Um, most do not overwinter and cleaned up until the garden or field site. So again, making sure to maintain that space. They're also someone, they are also folks that feed on brassica, family weeds and crops. They lay eggs at the base of the plant and the second generation emerges in late July and August. So you might come out there in June and, and not necessarily, I mean, at the beginning of July and you're like, oh, what are these, you know, little, uh, what are these little eggs? Go ahead and kill them because <laughs> you don't want to find out. That's the other thing. So here we go. Cute little guy. Harmful. Size, and you how, how big would you say those are? In you are like, very tiny. Right. I would say. Yeah. So this is a mag. I just want to emphasize this is a magnified image. They're about the size of a pinhead. Yep. 
Um, and you can see here, so their, their mechanism is that they're going to be chewing these little holes in your plants. So one thing you can do is give them something else to eat um, or just focus on giving them um, uh, under, really this is a good example of understanding that anatomy of this plant, um, of the beetle itself. Um, so management of that um, would be your crop rotation. So not necessarily, you know, if these are things that overwinter in, in that area, you don't want to then plant that same thing back in your space because now you're just feeding it again when they wake up. Um, you can remove old crops and clean up old debris during and at the end of the season, mulching with straw and other materials, row covers um, placed you can put your row covers placed on immediately after seeding or transplanting and sealed with dirt around all edges. Make sure to have no holes in fabric or edges. Um, that's for the best control. Leave row cover in place until harvest, um, until the harvest replace quickly after harvest or weeding activities. So you're gonna remove the brassica weeds from um, in and around the garden as well. And then you can plant some late brassicas as well um, after early July to avoid most of the flea beetle pressure, especially if early crops are kept clean. So if you're thinking about doing a second round of planting in the middle of the summer, um, this is one, these, you can go ahead and plant those later in the summer because at this point, you're mostly going to avoid the pressure of the flea beetles if you wait. Um, and you can experiment with it. If you go ahead and put some brassicas out now, you can see how susceptible they are now to the flea beetle as opposed to how susceptible they might be in the summer. Um, the next one um, is gonna be our cucumber beetle. Actually, um, give me one second. I'm sorry, guys. And Amanda, before you go on, I, there's a few questions. Mm -hmm. Let me know when you're ready. Oh, I'm ready, let's go. Okay. Um, so back to neem for a second. Can you use neem oil as preventative measure? Just assuming that at some point pests are coming. Oh, you can. You could if you wanted to. You know, spray it on the spray it around in the uh, kind of like like let's say you put some transplants in. You wanted to just kind of spray around the area. You can try. I've never. I've actually never used it as a preventative. Um, I've only ever come in and seen a pest and then come with the neem oil. So I personally not use it as a preventative, but I don't see why, the only reason that I can see why it wouldn't work is like, let's say you spray it and then it rains, um, then it's kind of like you went, you just, you know, you sprayed it, but there wasn't anything for it to get. Um, this is one of those things where it's like, if you were managing your, your garden in a way that was you know, you're, you're balancing this ecosystem. So let's say you're already doing a really good job with that. You could spray the neem oil, but you wouldn't necessarily know if the neem oil was effective in, prevent, in preventing if the garden space is being managed in a way that is done really well. So it's one of those that it's like, it's hard to tell if it's effective, but you know, the season's just getting started. If it's something that you really wanna try and then see at the end of the season, like, hey, you know, spraying that, around some of these plans made it so that they actually never showed up. Um, that is helpful. There are things that you would, we've talked We talked a little bit about some of the different things that you can put out um, in the garden. And those are things that you you would basically put out to leave and see if, if something's gonna take that bait. So you could, I, I don't see a reason other than it just raining and you needing, needing to um, consistently reapply that. Um, that would keep you from doing it. I just don't know if you would be able to see if it was effective or not. And then second part, if you start to see small holes on your crops, but never see a bug, is it, assume, it is assumed there's a problem and should you, be, you should begin pest management, question mark? So what you can do in that case is if you are out there, you never see, you never see a pest, but you are seeing things in your garden, the first thing that I would check is the health of your overall plant. So there are, you know, if your plants aren't, aren't healthy or maybe they're getting too much sun or maybe something else is interfering with the garden, that might be a natural element. That might be something that is contributing to the holes in your plants or the something in your plants. I planted, uh, let's see, I planted a lot of lettuce last year, but they were in a space that was under a tree 
Um, and it, it wasn't even very close to the tree, still had enough sun to be able to grow, but there was a fungus that was living on the tree that then when it rained, managed to jump down onto a lot of my lettuce plants. So although I never saw a, a pest in the garden, right? We were managing the pest. There were things in the natural environment that, were, that, were, that existed in the natural environment that contributed to the overall wellness of my plant. So I would think more so about, hmm, is there something that is not necessarily a pest? Is there a fungus? Is there some sort of disease on the plant? I would really consider the health of the plant first before going ahead and applying anything. I would think, you know, you know, I'm not seeing a pest, but I'm seeing a bunch of like super yellow leaves and holes on my tomatoes. So that could be something. Or I'm seeing a bunch of black spot all over my, all over my food. What is this? Is, you know, it's not necessarily a pest, but it is something that is, is um, putting pressure and stress on your plant. So I would start there. Um, if you go through all of that and you're just like, I, that nothing is helping, there's nothing in the natural environment that is doing this, then I would just kind of maybe I would switch some of the times that you're out there in the garden so that you can see maybe this pest is showing up in the middle of the day, or maybe it's coming in the evening and I tend to my garden only in the morning. So it could be something that you are seeing, but I would start with assessing the overall health of the plant first. Great. Mm -hmm. All righty, here we go. Cucumber beetle. So they overwinter as adults under plant matter and in and around the garden. They feed on all members of squash, cucumber, melon, and the melon family. Most damaging to small plants, usually less than five, you know, true big leaves. Um, they'll lay eggs at the base of the plant and the second generation hatches in July. So this is another one where if you're able to get in there and crush those eggs, you see those eggs in, in initially, then you can go ahead and kill them. And then you don't need to, I wouldn't say you need, wouldn't need to worry about it, but then that will contribute to how much pest pressure is actually on the plants. If you can get in and kill, the, kill crush those eggs beforehand. So you look at them, they're just having a great little meal on this leaf here. Um, Look, just like enjoying this plant. <laughs> um, and you can't blame them, right? You've in introduced something into their environment. So they're here to eat. Um, you just don't maybe want to feed, you know, you'd rather feed yourself with those things and not necessarily all of the critters and creatures outside. So here, let's talk about a little bit of management of those. So with your transplants, um, give plants a jump start at getting more than five leaves. So you might want to keep them growing in the greenhouse or growing in indoors or wherever you're setting up your seedlings, you might wanna do that for a little bit longer so that they're a lot bigger and able to be more resistant when they get outside. Um, compost, a handful in a transplant troll, uh, not troll, in a transplant hole will help the plants grow a little more quickly. Um, variety and selection, some varieties are more attractive and susceptible to beetle. Um, to the beetle itself, um, to, I'm sorry, to the beetle da damage um, and choosing fast growing hardy varieties can be helpful as well. So with this specific thing, you, you would want your plant to just be bigger, you know, so that they can defend themselves better. Uh, so plant later, so maybe in your second or third planting after the peak beetle activity. So going a little bit closer until like later into May, later June, um, even July, if you want to. I know our growing season, um, fortunately, due to climate change, has gotten a little longer. So you do have a little bit more time to put some things in your garden and do a couple of plantings before the season gets cold again. Um, row covers, especially on your cucumbers, can be helpful. And then again, cleaning up those old plants from the garden at the end of every season can be helpful too. All right, and so mammals, if I'm not mistaken, mammals are kind of like our last really big group of um, critters that we'll be talking about. It's difficult to eliminate small animal pests from the garden. The ideas listed below work well in certain circumstances and even better in combination with others. Try a combination of them and see what works for you to help minimize the damage. So this can be fences, traps, um, border plantings like your onions, marigolds, 
garlic, chives, mint. That's something I use. Um, comfrey as well. And they, I'm glad that this was written in here. Be careful with mint and comfrey because they can spread aggressively. Again, as someone who grows herbs, those are two herbs that are very hardy and around in the, in the garden space for sure. And so, um, yeah, that they can be helpful in deterring a lot of things. I can say from personal use, um, I actually use mint to keep, I use mint to keep squirrels and chipmunks away from my sunflowers and it, it works every year. Um, so an um, alternate food source outside of the garden may be a risky strategy if it attracts more pests. So you don't want to put something outside the garden that is just going to bring something else in that you also don't want. Human hair. Um, I, I don't usually use human hair. I don't think I actually, now that I'm saying it, I've never used human hair um, out there. So I can't say whether or not that would work, but I would, I would encourage you to try and see what works for you. Um, soap bars, uh, who is it? I think it's Irish Spring. If you can take up some Irish Spring shavings um, and shake those around in the garden um, and in around areas where um, you wouldn't be so sad if some of the plants didn't really make it. So around the borders of the garden, they can help to keep things out. There's a lot of uh, mammals that don't like the smell of it. Um, and repellent sprays often made of blood meal, blood meal urine, garlic, and are available commercially. You can actually make your own when you're talking about like garlic repellent sprays. Um, at the end of the year, um, I always have like a lot of garlic left over. And so I will, I personally take that garlic and I turn it into like honey fermented garlic to use as a, um, um, an, uh, uh, as an immune system boost through the winter. Um, so what you can do is take that garlic itself and soak it in water for a few days. Um, I recommend keeping it in the refrigerator because you don't want it to mold, but you can basically, it's just water and garlic and you can spray that in certain areas around the garden, not necessarily on the garden because you don't want it to burn any of the plants, but you can spray it around the garden and it can help to keep some things that really do not like gar that smell of garlicky, oniony, chivey. They don't really, uh, there's a lot of mammals that don't like that. So they'll, they'll stick out. Um, one thing that's on here is marigolds. I used to use marigolds to keep my keep bunnies in out of certain spaces, but what I found was that marigolds are actually they can be toxic to bunnies and other rabbits, and so I don't necessarily want to kill the rabbits and the bunnies in the space. Um, so I plant other things like mint and stuff like that because it'll it helps to keep them out. But if you're in a space where like maybe rab you know rabbit pressure is not super high, maybe there's like one or two that you wanna keep out, then I would recommend going with that. Um, and then outdoor cats or dogs, if you can keep them out of the garden. So that's kind of where, you know, maybe getting a, fit, a fence for the garden, but then having like an outdoor cat who sticks around in the area. Um, let's see. Oh, one other thing I wanted to add to this was trenches. So you can trench around your garden beds. Like let's say you've got some garden beds that sit on the ground. You can trench around them and then you can take like a garden mesh and put the put that around your garden space and put that mesh in the trench. Um, and then you can cover it up with a little bit of soil. And that is something that can help to keep mice and rats out of the garden as well. If you're growing a lot of fruits and vegetables, but maybe are not harvesting very quickly, then you can attract rats and mice um, and voles to come into your garden space. But by digging a trench around that space, you can help to kind of like give them a trap so that they kind of fall in and don't necessarily keep digging to get under and inside of your beds. Um, look at this cute little guy. He's really, I think he's adorable, but he's not so cute when he's eating your stuff. And we have a, a hookworm or- Horn, Hornworm? Yes, there we go, hornworm. Here we go. And let's talk about some common beneficial insects. So. What are natural enemies? Um, organisms that kill, decrease, reprodu um, kill, decrease reproductive potential or otherwise reduce the numbers of another organis organism. Um, how do they do this? Well, through predation, parasitism, herbivory, competition, um, antibiosis, and that's just when organisms secrete substances that inhibit vital activities from other organisms. Beneficial organisms, um, so predators, 
larva or adult um, haunts, they at attacks and um, consume prey. Examples include lady beetles, lacewigs, praying mantis, um, cypher flies, assassin bugs, minute pirate bugs, um, or I'm sorry, minute pirate bugs, spiders, and predatory, pred predatory mites. Each one eats many insects in its lifetime and they're not picky eaters. So that's kind of like an example earlier, we talked about kind of getting ladybugs to release into the garden. They can help to eat up some of the other guys and they will. Before we move on, I wanted to, there's a few questions related to the mammals. Um, so for groundhogs, I recently read ammonia, that ammonia in their hole and then filling it in would deter them. Has anyone, any, anyone else tried this? Um, I've, uh, you said for groundhogs? Yeah. I've not heard of ammonia, but I have found that if you take watermelon, um, cut it up and soak it in antifreeze, you can use that because they will eat it and they will not make it. So I've heard of that. I've not heard of um, ammonia though. Okay. Um, and then uh, just discussion, a few discussions about, um, wait, hold on a second. Uh, so what about cayenne pepper spray to deter uh, small animals? That, yeah, that's something that does work. Um, what you wanna do, if, if you're gonna be spraying something like a cayenne pepper spray or a garlic spray or something like that, what you wanna do is make sure that you're not spraying it directly on your plants. When you're thinking about mammals, they are, it's easier to just keep them out of the garden space as a whole than to keep them away from a specific plant. Because once they get in there, they're just going to eat. It doesn't really matter what it is. They're going to eat. Um, you have some mammals that are coming for specific things, but for the most part, they're just going to eat. They're going to eat till they're full. And then they're going to just keep continue to enjoy your garden because at that point, you grew that food for them. So what you want to do is just keep them out of the space. And so spraying something like that can help, but mostly I would recommend spraying it around the perimeter. So one, you can help to keep the mammals just out of the garden as a whole. And two, you're not harming the plants that are on the inside. Um, so Jesse's saying, I don't want to hurt the groundhog. Um, I mean, yeah, if you're, if you're like, you know, really not trying to, to actually kill this, um, then traps can help. So if you put traps around the garden, traps that are not, um, you know, traps that don't have claws, right? So something that's not going to hurt the groundhog or the gopher or the whatever, you know, whoever's there. Um, and then you can go and take it and release it somewhere very, very far away from your garden space. So you can do that. A lot of the time you don't necessarily need to hurt them because a lot of what you would spray it or like with those soap bars, right? They might eat it, but for the most part, they're gonna smell it from far away and they're just not gonna wanna come into the space. So that works. Okay, anybody else before we move on? Okay, all right. Here we go. So um, parasitoids. So, uh, immatures develop on or inside of a host, killing it as they mature. They emerge as adults and continue the cycle. Examples include parasitic flies and wasps. So um, I think we do have a picture here of some hornworms that will get, they do have a parasitic wasp that can overtake them. It's kind of like icky to see, but we will show you. <laughs> um, each one eats only one insect in its lifetime though, and they're usually very picky eaters. So if this is something that you wanna introduce into your garden space to help you get rid of a specific pest, make sure that you're focusing specifically on just maybe one or two different pests. You don't want it to be the thing that is gonna come in to save the entire garden because this is, that's not what they do. They're, they're coming to, to live in something else and kill it essentially from the inside out. Um, ladybugs or lady beetles. Um, larvae and adults eat soft body insects such as aphids, mealybugs, spider mites, caterpillars, um, 
insect and insect eggs. Um, they're voracious aphid feeders. They will eat up your aphids, um, which is nice. Look, this one has like a nice little, uh, a nice little buffet in front of it. Um, two main types of them. You're either going to get like the round or um, like an oval shape. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me, I have to move this little bar at the top. So seven spotted lady beetle, you can see here, we're just gonna look at more of the anatomy of it. So you can see here, this got like their two white spots on the thorax and then your seven spots on the back in that one, four, two pattern. So your one, uh, I can't tell if you guys can see my mouse, but in the top yes, right, okay. okay, perfect. Yep, so you've got your one, ooh, your four, and then your two. So that can help you to identify them. And then up here, usually when you're looking at the ladybug first, you know, head on, like on here, you'll see those two white spots. So that can help you to identify them. All right, seven spotted lady beetle, um, larva, the larvae like aphids, two. Ooh, yeah, this is like difficult to look at, but it is important so that you can kind of see what it, what it really is, what it's like. Um, the garden is a very interesting place. A lot goes on. Our pink, our pink spotted lady beetle here is another type. Yeah, ground beetle. So the larvae and adults attack aphids, slugs, snails, cutworms, caterpillars, um, nocturn and nocturnal forages, foragers. Over here, you can see this um, at the very bottom right, this adult feeding on a snail. And this is what they look like as adults and then the larvae as well. Hmm. All right, assassin bugs. So adults and nymphs attack many insects, including flies, tomato hornworms and other large caterpillars. Adult, um, and here are some photos of adults attacking caterpillars here. Go. There we go. Very interesting. That's another one. All right, a green lace wig. So Larvae attack soft-bodied insects, including aphids, thripes, mealybugs, scales, um, mites, and caterpillars. And then we have some more photos here of the larva, the larva eating here, it, this as an adult, and then uh, the lacewig larva emerging from the eggs over here as well. And some of our other predators, we've got our dragonflies, our praying mantis. All right, brachinoid wasp. So they parasitize army worms, cabbage worms, codling moths, gypsy moths, European corn um, boars, beetle larvae, um, let's see, flies, aphids, and other caterpillars and insects. Over here in the, on the right hand side, we've got a mummy of an aphid parasitized by a brachinoid wasp. Very interesting. Um, and then we've got some larvae emerging from the parasitized moth and larva. And then over here to the left, we've got the pupae on the tomato hornworm here. This is what I was referring to earlier. And they're just like all over this hornworm here. And then up top, over here to the top left, we have um, the parasitizing on a cold, I'm sorry, corn earworm as well. So they will, they will take over. Um, let's see. And here's some more photos of them. Oop. Right on here. And you can see how they just completely just, they will completely take, take over this hornworm. Here's another close up. And if I'm not mistaken, we are all set. That's not your email address. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's uh, not. But um, you we, guys, we, let me, I can put it in the chat. What are you? Yeah, is. right. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we do want to make sure if folks have questions on your presentation today that you can, they can contact you if you're open to that. Um, 
So Amanda's going to drop her email in the chat. Uh, there was a question here. I missed this one. Um, you mentioned Bovaria bassiana as a deterrent for grasshoppers and crickets. Um, heard that it is also harmful to bees, however. What is something that can control grasshoppers and crickets but leave my bees alone? Grasshoppers and crickets. Hmm. I, actually, that's a question that I would have to look into, yeah. mostly because I've never, I've never needed to remove grasshoppers or crickets from right. the, from my garden space, um, and I certainly would be focusing on something that wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to hurt my pollinators as well. Right. I do know that if you use um, a solution of borax and a little bit of water and put it in a bowl. It can help to attract wasp away from the garden space. Um, and I know that bees won't disturb it. So like that's kind of the only thing I know that like won't kill the bees at the same time. Well, you definitely want to make sure that you're not killing your pollinators. Yeah. But that one um, I would I, get I, I started I looked it up a little bit just to see. Um, but I, I didn't see anything that was specifically um, said something about them harming bees it is organic it is like an organic type of spray um so maybe if you J janet if you want to be more specific on what what they're damaging maybe that would help in like in the context um and then marguerite had a question earlier so she's thinking about melons and so you're, the question is, um, would trellising or covering a stock uh, uh, or, or covering in a stocking protect against pests? Um, uh, putting what in or covering what? And covering melons, trellising melon, any kind of melon or uh, covering the melon, the fruit in a stocking. Um, I would use more of like a stocking kind of material, not necessarily just like the leg of the stocking itself. I know that like I've used stocking legs as like a little brace to keep my trellised melons from like falling off the vine onto the ground. Um, but I've never used them to like wrap around the, the melon itself or a wrap around like the cucumbers or anything themselves. But I have just used like um, shade fabric to kind of drape over the space. And to, for me, that has been successful. Okay. I mean, and then also it's like, what is the past in that circuit? Like if it, that's not really gonna help with cucumber beetles, right? Um, so that that would be you know like we were talking about earlier is like kind of identifying the enemy or the or the problem. Um, yeah. Okay, well we, we we still have some a little bit of time left. Um, so if, if if anybody you know if you have particular questions, um, maybe we could come off of um, share screen so we can see everybody's beautiful faces. Um, Okay, Linda's got a question here. Oh, hold on. Uh, where to go? Linda, for pole beans, how to keep beads? Uh, how to keep birds from eating pole beans? What kind of covering and how to install? I have a trellis. Oh yeah, um, and that space then you can you can go ahead and put over. Um, you can try with some of that like shade fabric or some of like that planting fabric. It comes in like a white thing. I know if we, if you're part of the garden resource program in the first pickup that we did when it, we were picking up cold, some of those cold crops, um, they provided some of that same kind of fabric um, and you can use that. that. That was what I was referring to earlier when it was just like trying to keep something off my melons. If I have a big trellis, I can just drape it over that. And for the most part, it works. I've not, I've not had birds come back or try to get through it or anything like that. Okay. 
And again, you're welcome to come off mute if you'd like to ask in person or if you want to drop a question in the chat. I'm good. This is really helpful. Even though I come every year, I've been gardening, but I got some really good new tips today. So thanks. Yeah. That's all. All right. I have a question though. There's a Cheryl Howard on the line. Did she go to Michigan? I'm just asking somebody else on the line. That's all. Yeah. Mm. Hey, Cheryl, did you go to U of M? What? No, I went to Michigan State. Different Cheryl Howard. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. If you guys are active online in any way, your Instagram, your Twitter, anything like that, test out some of these methods and then feel free to like tag us in your post or send us the post um, talking about what kinds of success that you've had. One of the really, thing, really, really, really amazing things that I like about Keep Growing Detroit and a lot of what we do here in the city is the community that is available for everyone. So as we learn, we want you guys to learn. And as you guys learn, we want others to learn as well. So whatever you guys are, are, are dealing with over the season, like, please, you know, post that. Like, you're not, you won't be the only person with hornworms, I promise. Like, you won't be the only person getting a a different pest coming in the garden. So uh, just, you know, let us know. We can all keep continue to learn together. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, what, and um, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, you're good. Um, after oh, you, okay. Leslie, we'll go with uh, Garnetta. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, what um, suggestions do you have for deer? Ooh, okay. So I know one year I tried to do marigold. The, honestly, I know I keep bringing it up, but like mint is kind of my go-to to keep bigger pests out of the garden. And I, I don't know why the deer don't see, like why they stay away from mint so well, but that is the number one thing that has kept deer out of my garden. And so like my sister and I, we have Finnegan's Farms. It's here in Detroit. Um, but our parents own a homestead over in Ypsilanti and they're like out in the woods. And so they have a high, high, high deer population. And that's where I first learned to use the mint to keep them out. So I usually plant it as a border for the most part. And that works. The other thing that you can get is like a deer fence. Um, not everybody is like in a zone where they can just put up a fence. And so if you're not able to do that, creating a natural fence with some of that ground cover can help. But if you're in a space where you can put up um, just a quick fence, we, you can go on over to Home Depot or Tractor Supply and just get a few um, fence posts and then like some chicken wire to go around the garden. Another thing I've seen people do is add a dog kennel around their garden space. So if you only have a couple of beds and it's not so, you know, they're not, it's not such a big space. You can find dog kennels that are like seven by seven, eight by eight. They can be pretty huge. And you can kind of like put that as like a cage slash enclosure around your garden space. If you don't want to go through the trouble of like, you know, putting the fence posts in the ground and then hooking the, the chicken wire to it. So those are some of like my, like that fencing can help. Okay, great. Thank you. Janet, Janet also said in the chat to uh, try lights that are motion activated, or I've also seen um, sprinklers that are motion activated. Mm -hmm. So a few other ideas. Hello. Yeah, go for it. Hi, um, um, my name is Jennifer. To the lady that was asking about the dairy pollen, I've recently learned that lamb's ear, the plant, can be used as a border to repel the deer as well because they don't like um, plants that have fuzzy or woolly textures to them. So that's an alternative too. If you're not into building a fence, you, you have other plant options as well. Okay. okay. I have a question. It's Bernice. Um, my question is that in digging the trenches around um, the garden, can we just um, put the mint inside the trenches and let them grow even you know and let them grow around the garden to keep a lot of um a lot of the pests away as well because my problem i'm dealing with in the new area that i moved in i'm dealing with a lot of the possums okay so what i would do is because what I, what you don't want to end up doing is like digging the trench and then um 
building it back up on in the inside because the main thing that you're using the trench for is so that something can't like dig under your garden to then get in like kind of inside so if you're mostly working on like trying to get keep possums and things like that out of the space you would be better to just go ahead and plant it and not even worry about digging the trench or putting out some like live traps that can help you get that possum and take them away. And if that's not something that you wanna do, you can also call animal control because they will come and put out traps for you and they'll also come and empty them um, once something is caught. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Garnetta? Uh, I got a couple of questions. Now you say that uh, you use different kind of herbs in your garden to keep pests away. Can you have those herbs in pots and still kind of like put them around your uh, vegetation? Yes, you absolutely can. Now, what herbs did you say that would be good besides the mint and the marigold? Um, you can use lavender. Lavender will keep a lot of things out of the garden and it will attract your pollinators and it's you know beautiful and smells good. So that's nice. And one really good thing about lavender is that hummingbirds use it in their nests and they feed off of it as well and can feed off of it as well. So by adding like lavender, you're getting rid of a whole lot of things that really don't like lavender, but you're also introducing really, really good pollinators and, and a lot of other wildlife. Okay. So that's one that I recommend. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now my collards, um, it, they're getting holes in there, mm -hmm. but I didn't see any insects. Yeah. So, so that, um, in that case, I would look around and see, I would check, I would continuously check the health of the plant just to see like, if you are starting to notice that some of the leaves around where there's holes, um, those, you know, if they're getting starting to look a little yellow or maybe they're turning into like a pale green instead of like a dark leafy green, um, then it could be something that's really just the health of the plant and the way that the plant is growing. The other thing that you want to keep in um, keep in mind is you might not see the pest because it could be something like a cabbage moth. So that might show up and then fly away and then you wouldn't even know that they came to come and eat. So I would look at look into that too, because that, that's another way that's like maybe visit the garden at different times or maybe early in the morning or after you freshly watered the garden. Sometimes you will see them show up as soon as you're done watering the garden or in the morning when there's a, like a lot of dew, they'll show up. Um, even though as far as I know, they don't really love a lot of water, but they will show, they, they kind of will like appear kind of in that early morning. So you might not see them, but there's a really good chance that they're just coming when you're not there. You can also sometimes identify what the problem is if you just do like, like you got holes in like holes in my collards, just you could Google search that and you can get a differentiation. Like usually you'll get an image of flea beetle damage. You can get a sense of it's, if it's a flea beetle problem or if it's bigger holes, it could be that like, like Amanda was mentioning the, the cabbage worm, like the, you know, what the cabbage worm damage looks like. Okay, thank you. There was a question in the chat about um, purple death nettle um, or dead nettle because it's, a, it's close to the weed variety. Um, oh. It is, I'm sorry, not the weed variety. It's close to mint in its um, life. And so it can, sometimes it can help to deter bigger pests but the main thing that you're focusing on with that dead nettle is the fact that it is extremely resistant to insects and plant disease in and of itself so I wouldn't necessarily think about planting it or keeping it around to keep the mammals out but it can be used as like a trap crop or something like that because they can do a lot of deterring away of the pests itself so it's kind of like a, a little natural natural guy that can kind of help help you out. But yeah, they are, they can be very invasive. Very cute, but very invasive. <laughs> um, so the, there, uh, Carla's asking about the burning off method. I don't, do, do, I don't oh, know. Oh yeah. So if you have an extreme, extreme, extreme pest problem, and you know, we never really want to have to do this, but you could go in and burn off those crops. 
So that's something you can do. You definitely want to make sure that you're burning in a controlled way. Um, if you're if you have like a farm and you're going to be doing like a big burning, that's something that you would call the fire department for because they can help you to control that. Um, but what ends up happening when you burn that is that it not only affects the plants that are there, but it affects the soil as well. So if you have something that is living in the soil or like likes to overwinter in that soil, coming in and burning that soil can be there to kind of like kill that in the soil, if that makes sense. But it's kind of like a last resort. You don't want to just like light fire to your garden if you don't if you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Nicole saying, what's the very best way to deter houseflies, mosquitoes, and cabbage moths in the garden? Let's see. So mosquitoes, you can plant citronella in the garden, and that's helpful. Um, I actually have, um, and I know it's not going to be, it doesn't, it, you know, you're going to have to be there to watch it but you can get large incense sticks that are about um, like about as thick as like this pin top, just about. And they're a little over, they're about two feet long. They're just like huge citronella incense. Um, and you can get those. And what I'll do is if I'm out there and I'm working in the garden and I'm just like, have already put on my bug spray, but we all know that the Michigan mosquitoes are pretty relentless. Um, I will go and literally put those sticks of incense around in the garden where I'm working and just burn them as I'm out there. That's something that I use to get rid of mosquitoes um, or to keep mosquitoes out of the area. Um, sometimes that also works with house flies. A lot of the time, some of those insects don't really like that smoke. It's not even just the smell of it. They just don't really like being around that smoke and they'll, they will leave. In terms of cabbage moths, you would be focusing on something that would help to kill your cab to, to kill the cabbage moths, but you would want to be focusing on them more as they're like larva um, or like little caterpillars. That's really where you're going to want to get in there. So when you're trying to get rid of your cabbage moths, you would want to look into like when is the peak season for them so that you can understand their life cycle a little better and then get in there while they're very young to just like crush, you know, crush the eggs or like remove the, remove the, the little caterpillars before they can do much on, on your garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody else? Oh, yeah. So the large citronella sticks, um, they sell them at garden centers. They've been selling them a lot more. Last year, they were kind of hard to find, but now every time I go to different garden centers, they have them in the corner. And um, another thing that you can do is if you don't want to go to the garden center, if you go to any like metaphysical shop or, or a, um, a space like that, where they just sell lots and lots of incense of different types, then they most of the time will have one that is citronella. Mm -hmm. And it, those are usually more inexpensive than the ones you would get at the garden center. Um, those are usually, you know, like 10 for a dollar or something like that. Uh, is, the cabbage, is the cabbage caterpillar green? Let me look that up. I haven't seen any little baby cat, cat, cabbage moths in a long time. Um, yes, they're like little fuzzy green guys. Yeah, they're green and you, you'll find, um, always inspect, you know, inspect the whole, if you see the damage on the plant, you can start to inspect the whole plant. Um, sometimes they'll be on the undersides of the leaves and you'll see the eggs in uh, clusters. You can, uh, they'll like look like little eggs standing on end and you can, you wanna get rid of those. But they're like a little, green caterpillar. That's right. That's where they, that's where you're going to, she said, I had, I had green caterpillars on my kale and collards. Um, that's, that's the culprit. Uh, Got to squish those guys or pay, pay some young child, young person to do it for you. <laughs> <laughs>
Yep. And neem oil also works as well. So when you get out there and you see them, you can do that. Oh, yes, here. Um, I did plug my contact information in, but I'll go ahead and type it one more time here. Or... I got a question for you, Amanda. Your last name is Bruzzle. Where did Fennigan's Farms come from? Uh, give me one second or... There we go. You can either reach us here on our, um, at our email, um, or you can reach out to us and send us a message on Instagram or Twitter. I will say, if you send us a message on Twitter, it might be a couple months before we get back to you because nobody's ever on it. But if you send us a message on Instagram or through our email, someone will get back to you. Instagram is the quickest because it's the thing that we utilize the most. Oh no, you tried neem oil last year and it burned your crops. This year, if you're going to do it, um, I would try to dilute it quite a bit because that might contribute to why it burned the crops. Um, I would just, whatever you diluted it as, I would do that half again. So whatever you did last year, take that same amount and add an equal part of water to that so that it's diluted by half, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, so Finnegan, it was actually um, our family dog. So he um, does uh, hospital visits and school visits. He's a therapy dog. And so he was somebody, you know, he's a dog that just, you know, brings a lot of joy and to a lot of places and can be there to, to, to really br brighten up a space. Um, for a long time, his main visit was just to Children's Hospital. So we saw, um, you know, basically the effect that he had on folks. And we agreed that that was the effect that we wanted to have across the city was that like when people hear about us, when people get to know us that, you know, they're talking to somebody who's friendly and excited to get to know them and excited to learn with them. So yeah, that plus the alliteration of like Finnegan and the farm, it just kind of went together. Yeah. But Cute. yeah. Oh, I just oh, I saw, let's see, this last one here. Oh, thank you, Marguerite. Uh, we worked hard on that website. Um, also, um, here it says, I also saw that coffee grinds eliminate ants and cats. They can um, <clears throat> do that. But what you also can, can run into with your coffee grounds is that they can burn your plants as well. So if you're going to use them to keep something out of the garden, think of that as you using like the cayenne pepper spray or the garlic spray. You don't necessarily want to put them on the plants because they can, re or like directly in the soil very close to the plant because you don't want to burn, end up scorching or burning your plants from that. They're easier to use around the perimeter of the garden itself. Okay. And I think that might be it. Nice website, by the way. I visited it while I was sitting here. Thank you so Finnegan's much. Finnegan's Farm, yeah, nice. Thank you, thank you. We put a lot of, uh, of uh, labor into it, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, I put a little tiny container, like a little tiny glass jar in a raised bed, because it's small at a community garden of peppermint oil, and mm -hmm. it, kept the squirrel, it kept the squirrels away. They were munching yeah. on everything. Yeah. So they still hang out, they just don't munch on the vegetables there. So. Yeah, and that's a really, thank you for, for mentioning that, because if you're someone who doesn't necessarily want to plant mint in the garden because of how much it can spread, then yeah, just having that, uh, that mint oil out there, that can be very, very beneficial. So thank you for saying that. What about spearmint? Is it, is it just as effective as um, mint? Mm -hmm. And in fact, what I've done is I'll mix a few. So like the cool thing about mint is that it will cross pollinate itself. So you might start with like four different kinds of mint at the beginning of the year, but after they've lived through the winter and you come back, they'll the flavors and the, the look of the plant will actually start to, to, to favor each other. So last year I planted like a lime mint, a pineapple mint, a chocolate mint, and then a spearmint, and then just like your standard peppermint. Um, and now this year, it's like <laughs> a very interesting patch of mint um, behind my parents' house. <laughs> but um, yeah, you can you can do a variety of them, and it's fun because they've got you know got a lot of different flavors and things like that too. 
Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Great questions. Okay, yes, definitely. Great questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to put this together and share this information with these folks. Um, we will be sharing the slides with everybody and the, um, the you, we're going to put the recording up on YouTube on the Keeper on Detroit's YouTube channel. So stay tuned for that. I will email everybody with the information on both those things, everybody who registered. Um, so, and, uh, you know, be sure uh, Amanda and uh, her sister has some great stuff on her, on her Instagram. So be sure and check that out. Um, and we'll catch you at the next one. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me. I had fun. Okay, great. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you guys. Great job. Good night, everybody. Thank you.